On today's podcast, I'm going to be talking to two experts from Wonder Minds Advisory Committee, which is a mental health ecosystem created by Selena Gomez. And we're going to be talking about the things that hold new habits from starting, things that hold you back. So we're going to dive into this topic with Dr. Jessica Stern and Dr. Nina Polline about their new podcast, Baggage Drop, which gives you lots of little ideas for how to get into a new habit. Join me today. Well, I am really excited to have Dr. Jessica Stern and Dr. Nina Polone with me in the studio today to talk about an amazing new venture that you've both dived into. But before we start, would you mind both just giving a little bit, my audience a little bit of your background of who you are and what you do? Okay. So hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Nina Polone, and I'm based in California, but licensed in both California and Pennsylvania. And I'm a clinical psychologist. I started as a professor at the University of California, San Diego, and since went on to create my own private practice focusing on treating individuals experiencing stress and burnout, specifically for high achievers and high demand positions, as well as I have an interest specifically in treating couples, especially high achiever couples, you know, those type A personality partners who uh, have a hard time really getting along. So um, I've also been grateful enough to have a consulting business where uh, through program development, I help companies explore the intersection between emotional, physical, and spiritual wellness. Beautiful. Thank you. Dr. Jessica. I'm Sure. I'm Dr. Jessica Stern. I'm a clinical psychologist and clinical assistant professor at NYU Lincoln Health in New York City. And I, along with Dr. Paul and I are, we're both advisors at Wondermind on the advisory committee. In terms of me and my practice, I do a variety of different things. So I do clinical work with individuals focusing on anxiety, ADHD, depression, stress, and trauma. Um, I also do a lot of corporate consultations. So I work with companies and teams helping them achieve corporate wellness and creating just good cultures within their you know teams and environments. And I love talking about productivity and building habits and finding ways to increase maximization without creasing this toxic work style that a lot of people have and just helping people live aligned with their values. I love that. Well, you're both doing an incredible job and I love the, the, you, what's happening at Wondermind. So tell us what's going on there with the new podcast and what is it called Baggage Drop? I love that. Sure. So we are, we're so thrilled with Wondermind and the mission. It's such an incredible company. So this is a company that was co-founded by Selena Gomez and Mandy Tifi to really help democratize mental health and help people achieve wellness in ways that are manageable and sustainable for them. So the idea here is that we want to decrease stigma around some of these really important topics related to mental health and well-being by increasing information that's really accessible on our website, through newsletters, through podcasts, things like that, increasing conversation about these topics. That way people feel a little bit less alone. Some people are in therapy and like to take these topics that we talk about to their therapy sessions where other people either don't want therapy, can't afford it, don't have accessibility to it. So what we're trying to do is increase accessibility to knowledge and information that's evidence-based to help people basically build tools in their life to help maximize their wellness in a variety of different capacities. And um, we love what we're doing. It's such a just incredible culture to be a part of, really just breaking down those barriers of stigma and baggage drop comes into play. And I'll let Dr. Polonay take over and share a little bit about baggage drop and what we're doing here. Of course, of course. So what makes Baggage Drop unique is that it's a mental fitness podcast uh, that not only provides insights, but also tangible tools to help us rewire our brain. Um, and I know that you know a lot about that, Dr. Leaf. Uh, and so we really have, we structured it in a way where, you know, we have a podcast, it's 10 minute episodes. So we make them very clean, very short. So you can listen to them on the bus to, to school or to work. Um, and we really want to encourage people to listen over and over. So what we know about building skills is sometimes it takes 30 days. Most times it takes 60 days, depending on the neuroscience or what you're, what you're looking at. And so it's really important that we wanted people to access this podcast and listen to it over and over. And then another thing we love about Baggage Drop is as psychologists, sometimes the most difficult transition is from therapy to the outside world. Like how do we get these skills into our everyday life? And so I like to recommend this podcast to my patients, to my clients. And then I hope that they disseminate that information to their friends. And I know that's something that myself and Jessica feel very passionately about is that like we hope to teach this information and then we hope that person teaches the next person. And I think Baggage Drop does like such a great job of that. 
pay it forward. And that's it go. absolutely. That's wonderful. Yeah. So it's really important to be able to have those bite-sized chunks that you can actually play it forward. I'm pleased to hear you say about the, you know, the in terms of the time frame of automatization or habit formation, because mm-hmm. there's so much around that. And, and I've been doing work in that for years. And we've just just publishing a paper at the moment and have started another huge study. And we can I can honestly tell you that the um it's but to, to to get your peak performance you have at least 66 days 60 yes. to 66 days so we created a program where I've done research created a program on a 63 day cycle but that's if it's a simple behavior if it's more if it's com if it, as we know the bigger the trauma the bigger the issue the more cycles right. you actually need so that that is so important and it's not just a mindless repetition it's a mindful repetition right and, Build that very mindful, you know, automaticity. Where even if you trigger, you're going to still, you're going to still be able to move forward and and remember how what you've practiced and what you've learned. So I think the idea of having these little ten minute type technique things is fantastic. Can you give us some examples? Can you give my viewers and listeners an example of what sort of techniques they would learn if they come and listen to Baggage Drop? Well, Dr. Jessica, you did a great job of kicking off the podcast. Thank you. I appreciate that. So at the beginning of the podcast, one thing that was really crucial for me to share a little bit about was this idea of values and and having people figure out what their why is. And so that's a question that I asked pretty consistently in the first couple of episodes is what is your why? Because we know that if we want to build a new habit, create a change in our life, it's really important for us to understand the context in which that habit starts or should be living. And so figuring out what your why and your value system is really important. And so we start there, we orient people's compass to that question. I ask people, what's their North star? That's another way of thinking about what your why is. So that way, when the it gets tough sometimes to do these things and they make these changes, it can be really helpful to reconnect with that question of why am I doing this to begin with? Why do I want to overcome the obstacles that are coming my way in terms of achieving this? And being able to orient and orient yourself is really crucial in terms of establishing again that context for that habit formation. So that's where we start. And then throughout the course of the podcast, we talk about obstacles that are really common to people. We talk about building support systems and things like that. And that's when Nina's episodes kick in and she talks about a lot of fun things too. So I'll let her take right. it. Right. <laughs> yes. Uh, so like you said, Jessica, I think that community is such a big piece of our healing work. And so uh, we were really happy that Dr. Ryan Howes, which is also another expert uh, that does a few, he has a few episodes with our podcast and he does a really great job job of describing that. Also, Allo Johnson, who is a marriage and family therapist, he's also an expert at Wondermind. He uh, describes the how to habit stack, which I know we might get into a little bit more detail in the future. Uh, And then my week is the fourth week. And so I think sometimes what we oftentimes forget is that first, uh, we have to have self-compassion when we're creating new habits, because we may not hit that goal right away, or maybe we hit it and then we backslide a little bit. And that's sort of the natural progression of when we're uh, developing a new habit and that's okay. And so my piece is really about increasing our self-compassion. It doesn't mean that you're super into yourself or you're narcissistic in any way, but how can we really have compassion for ourselves uh, and really humanize ourselves and humanize our experience? Um, And then of course I talk about joy. I'm a really big uh, proponent of celebrating yourself. And so when you do hit that mark, and even if you hit just a small piece of that habit, maybe you didn't get fully into it, but just a little bit, how can you celebrate yourself along the journey? Because we can have celebration and also uh, we can go through hard times too. And how do we hold space for both? Fantastic. That's so, these are such important things to be helping people not just here, but apply. And, and based on that, do you give some examples of how you would guide a person in, 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 being kind to yourself. You know, we hear so much about self-compassion and all that. And I can tell you from a scientific perspective, it changes your brain and all that stuff. But what does that look like? People hear, you know, five gratitude statements when you wake up or what does it look like on a practical level to have compassion and kindness towards yourself? I think that's a great 
conversation to have, um, especially because, like you said, there's so much neuroscience behind uh, the power of self-compassion. You know, oftentimes we learn to become more negative. Like we kind of listen to that negative bias in our minds that tells us like we're not good enough. And we think that's going to drive us towards the goal. Um, But from what we know in the research, that actually doesn't help us sustain the goal. And so self-compassion is a really incredible way that we can sustain our goals with self-love. And you're right. So many people might say like, what does that even look like? Um, And I always like to tell my clients or patients that like even just developing um, a relationship with yourself in the mirror, sometimes the first voice that comes out, out in the mirror is a negative voice. But how can we switch that to just a neutral voice of having a conversation, talking about how you're feeling, um, and also relating yourself to the outside world. Um, we give great advice to other people, but sometimes we don't give that to ourselves. And so how can we be kind to ourselves? So how could you, how would you talk to your friend? Um, maybe you might give them more compassionate language. How can you switch that to focusing on yourself? And the more self-love that you develop over time, the more you can naturally give love to other people. People and it does, it's not exactly the opposite, which is, I think, sometimes what people actually believe or think. So um, I think it's really just about developing a better, deeper relationship with yourself. And it doesn't have to be this like uh, corny, like, oh, I have to just say all these positive things to myself in the mirror. If you like that, fine. But um, it could just really say like, you know, I'm having a, I'm having a, an okay day or like I'm having some challenges today and it's all right. It's okay. Um, I'm just like everybody else. And, you know, here are the things that I'm doing well. Um, and that could be like a simple statement, but it really needs to be natural to the human. And so it self-compassion might look different for every person. Mm, I like that. And it's also very important that it's that one practices it because the first time you say that to yourself, you're so used to it. You say most of the time when you look in front of the mirror, you're going to say something negative. So you've right. Almost, you've almost got to build in the habit of being kind, not almost. You actually do have to. That's some of the things that when that I also advise people is you actually have to maybe do a whole 63-day cycle of practicing being kind to yourself. Because it's actually quite an eye-opener, isn't it? When when someone stops and st- looks at how your self-talk looks and how hard we are on ourselves, and how oh, why did I do that and getting so mad with yourself and being able to observe that I think is so important that's it yeah and I'm glad that you mentioned the 60 days too because a lot of people will come in and say oh it's not working I did it for two days and like I still don't feel that kind to myself and I like that you're referencing that it does take a while and the repetition does matter yeah, what, what we found over the literally over these 38 years and with the research we do now is that it's it's cycles of 63 today. So it's somewhere between 59 and 66 for a cycle. So it works nicely within a tw- three lots of 21. So I've worked out a whole system in that. But people do stop around day four, day seven, day 14. There's certain points where people stop. And then that's when they get stuck. And it's that whole thing of, I'm sure you've experienced this. I mean, we're having a back and forth conversation now, but they'll say, and I've, we've all had this ourselves where I know where I want to be, I know what the cause is, I know that I've got there a little bit, but now I'm stuck. There's this like chasm between where you are now and where you know you can be. And that's so frustrating for people. You know, and that's where the 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 automatization effect needs to kick into place, where you've got to mindfully practice and stabilize that 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 information. So a little the little baggage drop idea is great to help people to replay that and just to motivate them. Because when you hear it, it's also so much easier. Yes, 100%. Every time you, you know, we go for walks on the beach at six in the morning with our dogs and we bump into this one, we bump into people that we know and people are walking with their podcast, you know, their podcasts going. So you can, you can, there's so, there's so many opportunities for us to listen to good stuff, you know, and to, that'll help us change. So it's a great way of doing it. Yeah. Thank you. I wanted to ask you about the obstacle, Jessica, you mentioned about obstacles and you said you spoke about that. And I know that's something that people are familiar with. Could you give some nice practical examples of the sort of obstacles that you found have been quite a challenge for people? I know it's specific, you know, people are unique, but there's, there's maybe there's a few standard ones you can talk about. Sure. Before. Yeah, I think it tends to fall into two broad categories. One are the external obstacles. So those are things that are logistically difficult in certain capacities, whether it's you know money or other resources that are impacting a change. Maybe you have roles or responsibilities that are impacting a change. Let's say you're a parent or a caretaker or something like that. Um, 
maybe it's work, maybe it's other personal circumstances that are impacting it, but anything that's sort of external to you. And then there's the internal obstacles. So those are the things that I think are psychological. So those are the negative thoughts that we have, the um, self-critical thoughts that Nina was talking about before, other ways in which we get in our own way. And that I think is sometimes a little bit more subtle and a little bit harder for people to pick up on. Like they might say, oh, I don't have time to do X, Y, or Z habit. But what they don't realize is that embedded in that is also a connected internal thought that's maybe holding them back in some capacity. And so what I encourage people to do is to think about what are the obstacles in both of those broad categories that are holding you back from making that change or that habit formation and thinking about what are ways to circumvent that. Now, the issue is that a lot of times people will start to add obstacles to other obstacles. So they might try and problem solve a way to create a habit before they can even finish their sentence. They're finding another obstacle, right? And so what we try to do is have people slow down and say, don't problem solve through all the obstacles yet. Just dump out all of your ideas onto a piece of paper or onto your phone and let's work by one by one with them to try and figure out how they can potentially come into formation and how you can think them through. Because sometimes we sabotage ideas before we actually give them full thought because we're fe- we're fearful of things. We're, we're worried that something might not work out or that it might breed some sort of change that we won't be able to sustain. And that could be really scary for people. And I think to your point before is, Sometimes we have very clear ideas of the change that we want to make, but the state that we're in, even if it's not optimal to us, it's comfortable to us and it's familiar to us. And making a change, even if it's good for us, could sometimes be scary because it's novel and that novelty we know can hold people back. In some cases, that novelty pushes people forward. And there's a lot of neuroscience behind both of those sides of the coin. Um, But being able to help people figure out what's getting in their way internally and externally is, is I think, one of the first early steps. Mm, I love that. That's really great. I know you have a workbook. I'm just having a look here. You've got a workbook coming out. Do you want to talk about that and what that is and what, what you're going to be doing with that? Sure. Thank you so much for asking. So I have a workbook called the Productivity Power Kit, which is available now on my website. And the idea here is It's a series of worksheets that I have created through basically over 15 years of my experience in working on productivity. And it's oriented towards helping people figure out how to manage the various different responsibilities they have in their busy lives. And something that I learned of myself is I I used to call myself a productivity junkie. Like I used to consume all of the books and the podcasts and Nina knows this well about me and I loved it. But what I found is that sometimes it felt like a rat race of trying to figure out what the best tool is and what the best app is and all those types of things. And what ends up happening is that I think we as a community have really glorified the concept of hustle, myself included. The struggle is that that's not sustainable. What's that? Hustle culture. Hustle culture, right? And there's something glamorous about it, but that I think also breeds burnout. And so my goal in helping people with productivity is helping people create sustainable change in their productivity to make them feel like they are empowered and like they are bosses in their lives and that they're doing the good things that they want to do, but in a way that's sustainable for them, such that if any change in their life comes up and maybe sets them off the routine, that they know where to pick back up on. And so the Power Kit is a workbook that is oriented towards helping people overcome that. It focuses on time management and productivity and task management. And there's a section of organization as well. And I'm actually working on a course that's going to be out soon on productivity around this concept of non-toxic hustle. And so um, I'm really passionate about it. I'm very excited about it. That's really good. I think passion is so important because then you know it, it, you'll bring in a lot of practical, real stuff into the that works for people, which is yeah. really exciting. And it's so true. You know, this had, I, I was having a very interesting conversation with someone this morning about productivity and an interview actually and and hustle culture. And we, although we didn't use the word hustle culture, a comment came up about how or a point came up, and we were both debating this back and forth. So I'd love to throw it out there to you. When you when you really love something, like I absolutely am obsessed with the research that I do. I don't find it tiring. I find it very relaxing. And you can get so caught up and we get really, you know, hours can go by. And the and what um, the person was saying, and I and I actually agree with this person that I was interviewing totally, that when you love some when you love doing something, 
it's actually so invigorating and improving your, of your creativity. I think where the burnout comes in is that when we're doing stuff that isn't what we love to do, and a lot of, not 100% of everything is going to be what you love doing. And there's always the, the you know, the basic stuff that we have to do if you're running your own practice or running your own business. It's, it's not the most enjoyable, but it's 20% of whatever you have to do. The thing is, is to find that um, 80% that is something that you love, that your time is being consumed with something that really invigorates you, which is so important to contribute to mental health. I'm just going to throw that out there and take it. Maybe, Nina, do you want to jump on that first and just add your comments? Because I think it's... So yes. Really this sparked so much in me when you were speaking, <laughs> Caroline, because, yes, because I think that true, it's so true that, like, you know, we all have our own inner compass and we have to listen to it. And so a lot of times physiologically, what that can look like is paying attention to our body. So how am I feeling in my body? Am I feeling tense and constricted or am I feeling expansive? Do I feel excited like you were sharing? And so I think paying attention to our body through breath work or through meditation can be really helpful. And also there's so much meaning in those like darker burnout rock bottom as so they speak. Uh, so they say, uh, phases of our life because it gives us information. It gives us information about maybe where we were uh, sort of giving too much or something that maybe it's like an activity that we just don't really like doing anymore and that's okay. Um, but it gives us information and then we always grow from there. Um, and so I love this idea that you're mentioning just around like listening to your body, listening to what fills you up and going with it, um, instead of what we usually do is we listen to those outside forces of, you know, maybe our parents or other friends, or we look at what other people are doing and we try to match that. Um, and that is a surefire way to get yourself into burnout. And so really focusing on yourself, learning to trust yourself and listen to yourself will really help you highlight the energy inside of you and really start to help you spark, uh, that creativity. I agree so much because it really, because when you talk, you mentioned what really sort of triggered that in me to bring that into the conversation was also the whole time management thing, because that can also get you so caught up because maybe your time, you know, there's so much emphasis now on self-care, which is great and work-life balance, which is great, but we've got to also, can almost go to the other extreme where you feel guilty if you're not having work-life balance, but what if, if mm -hmm. your balance comes from pouring into something that you really love and that invigorates you and right. gives you that, that burst of energy. So that, that external thing of you must do this at this time, you must switch off at this time, that doesn't work for everyone. You've got to find your own little routine that works for you. Right. And I even think about people who have, you know, positions or jobs, maybe they can't switch their job. Maybe they want to do something totally creative and different than what they're doing, but mm -hmm. their means don't, you know, they're not able to do it. But how can you, like you were describing, take, you know, two hours to bake on a Saturday, if that's really what you want to do. And your dream is to start uh, a bakery at some point in your life. So how can you kind of in a small ways, integrate the things that you love into your life, even if you are kind of like stuck in a position that you have to work just because of finances or whatever. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. I love that. JC, do you want, do you want to add to that? Sure. And I think you bring up a good point, Caroline, which is that you need to find what works for you. So I think for a lot of people, let's say they're going on vacation and they might want to completely disconnect from work and not do anything. For some people that works really well, whereas for other people, they find that that actually creates anxiety of all the work that they're going to want to do or need to do when they get back. So maybe for those folks, I actually recommend that they can find maybe an hour once a day or an hour the day before they fly back from their vacation where they can do a quick check-in on their email so that way they feel a little bit less anxious about returning back. And so there's not going to be a one-size-fits-all for everybody. And so being able to personalize it to you and your lifestyle and your needs is important. And you know, I think to this question about burnout, one of the things I talk a lot about in time management is this concept of set shifting, which obviously has a lot of neuroscience behind it, where context is shifting. And I think what's difficult is that there are a lot of us that are doing things that we're incredibly passionate about, and we're also balancing it with the other things that we just have to do as adults that we don't necessarily want to do, but we have to do, right? And even within our jobs, there might be things that we love, and then there might be the mundane tasks that we enjoy a little bit less. And the struggle is that we as humans are constantly set shifting, which means that we're switching between one task or one type of uh, thinking or framework in our brains to another. And every time we switch sets, it costs us time and energy. And that constant 
sort of chronic set shifting that's happening can actually lead to exhaustion or even burnout if we're doing it so much so that we can't refill our cups. So even if you're doing something that you really love, if you can find a way to reduce that so you can focus on the things that you do love, that can be meaningful. Because I agree, Caroline, like when you love what you do, it's like it fills you up. It doesn't drain you, right? It just totally fills you up. Like these types of things, Nina and I love doing them. We could do them forever and ever and ever, yeah. these interviews and stuff like that. Conversations. I mean, they're so stimulating. Yeah. Yes. Everyone else doesn't find them stimulating, but I certainly do because it's, yeah. it's to it's to get that, it's as you say, to fill you up. If it's filling you up, that's fantastic. Try and have as much of that as possible. And if it's draining you, try and limit that. And that's the whole concept of boundaries as well, or creating the yes. space. You know, and there's certain things that have to be done, but you know, I don't know if if um, like people pleasing, you try and someone says do this, this, this. You've got to learn to say, hey, listen, I'm going to do that, but I'm doing this and this and this first, and I'll do that later. And I've had to learn to do that. You know, jumping, running my own company, and in charge of a lot of different things, everyone's pulling on you all the time, and you've actually got to be able to say, okay. I will do that, but I'm doing this and I'll do that then. And that would work. And that's made a huge difference in my life, which keeps the level of enjoyment. As soon as I start that that set, that switching, that between trying to get everything done in a certain amount of time, it, it, that's, what, that's what's more tiring than yes. hours and hours of research. So, yeah, if you, as far as, no, you can't always, sometimes you just have to, like this, something has to be done. But if you can control that as much as possible, it does shift the burnout aspect so much. And I love that you're describing the people pleasing because I think a lot of us uh, are, you know, grappling with that, figuring out how to get out of that cycle, uh, as well as the boundary work. And that's something that we highlight in Baggage Drop, uh, the podcast as well. We talk about that fact that like you could hit that point where you set the boundary and you're like so excited about yourself. You're like, yes, I put myself first. I'm so excited. Now I can have all this room for doing the things that I really love. And then you might have another opportunity to people please and you might feed into it. <laughs> and so how can you have the self-compassion when you do kind of feed into the people pleasing that, you know, it's sort of in the brain, it's sort of like that natural response that you're having because it is a new habit. And so sometimes we kind of fall back a little bit, but how can we have compassion for ourselves in that moment, knowing that we're giving it our best and we'll keep going, right? We'll continue. Let's see, well, the compassion activates that natural resilience. It unmasks resilience. Whereas that you know, I've got to do this. I've got to, I've got to rest now, you know, that kind of thinking, which is counterproductive because the resting is supposed to help you, but you're supposed to be resting now because isn't everyone telling you to take self-care and all this kind of stuff. And I've got to balance that in itself can create so much internal stress and mess around with, you know, your psycho, psycho neurobiological network in, in the worst way possible. And that, 100%. Is, that, that drain to try and shuffle around everything to 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 please culture the zeitgeist people around you so it's really to find that it goes back to the value you know what is it that you want to achieve in a day and in a week and a month and a life kind of thing mm -hmm. yeah so important well if I, what if we, there's so much I'm, that we can cover but i mean what is i think you've got some worksheets as a bonus a bonus on the website there's some worksheets is that correct that people can get as a bonus yeah. So Nina and I, along with our other two co-hosts, created worksheets to go along with Baggage Drop. So at the end of every week of Baggage Drop, there's a corresponding worksheet. And the reason that we did that is we wanted to help people take the content that they're consuming through the podcast and turn it into concrete change. So we know that writing things down, creating set goals, creating smart goals, oh, those, all those types of things, that's where the change happens. And so each one of us created a worksheet corresponding with each of the weeks that we've done. So that way people can follow along and can actually create a change path for themselves. Oh, that's lovely. I love that. That's wonderful. Well, what, what pearls of wisdom could you both drop for people before we, if, a pearl of wisdom that comes out of baggage drop that you could drop for people before we end off this podcast? And what else do you feel like people need to know? So let's start with the, let's, let's start with this. Let's start with before the pearl of wisdom. Is there something else that you'd like to cover or say before we go to that final pearl of wisdom? That we haven't That's covered. a great question. Yeah, Nina, how yeah, about I have to think about it. Um, I'd say before we go into the pearls of wisdom, I would just share that um, it's so important on this road of healing that we remember healing is a process 
that goes on for the rest of our lives. And so I think, yeah. And so for some of us, we kind of get into that perfectionistic mindset of like, okay, let me listen to baggage drop for 60 days over and over on repeat until I hit my healing point and then I'm done. Um, But I really hope that people can take baggage drop as sort of like a a gentle reminder, come back to it over and over if you have to. Um, It's there for you anytime you need it. But remember that we're not looking for perfectionism here. We're just looking to make our life a little bit more meaningful, more joyous, more fun. And we're learning skills to cope with the down spirals that happen for all of us. Uh, you know, life isn't always uh, roses for everybody, but how can we get through and cope with those times? And so um, I, I guess I would like to, to make sure to share that. That's wonderful. I love that. Jessica. Yeah. And I think to piggyback off of that, is we are dynamic humans, meaning we are ever changing. And, you know, I talk very, very briefly in the first episode of Baggage Drop about neuroplasticity and what that is and what that means. And not only are our brains changing, but our circumstances are changing too. And the reason I think that's important to highlight is because our needs are going to change and our our values are going to change. And what we want to do is we want to consistently come back to the drawing board to check in with ourselves and make sure that we're living aligned with whatever it is that we need in that season of our life. And that if we created a habit or a goal or we set a value or whatever it might be that is no longer jiving with us, that's okay. It just means that maybe it needs a reassessment and that maybe that piece can be retired or maybe it needs to be rejigged or something like that. And so I think remembering that we are dynamic humans that are constantly changing can I think going back to what Nina was saying, it can allow us a little bit of self-compassion to create a little bit of room to grow and to move around a bit. I love that. You know, I did some of the first neuroplasticity research back in the late 80s, early 90s, when they didn't believe the brain could change. At that stage, they didn't believe this. In that stage, the mind was seen as separate from the brain, which is the correct philosophy, but they didn't think the brain could change. So I was I did some of the first research there, which was a challenge. And I say that to say, once we hit te- techno- technological fMRIs and so on, mid-90s, we could see inside the brain and see the changes. But the brain is no, and the point being made to, to piggyback off what you're saying is that our brain is only is only going to do what our mind tells it to do. So the mind is doing the work. The mind is our liveness and processing everything through the brain. So you're, I think people in this day and age think that their brain controls them, but it doesn't. So neuroplasticity is driven by the mind. The brain only changes because the mind is changing. And as you said, our circumstances constantly change. So therefore, and it's exactly what I said to that professor back in the 80s when they said the brain can't change. And I said, but that can't be possible because our context and our circumstances and our lives are changing. So it sounds crazy because you're both much younger than me, but you've both grown up in the world of neuroplasticity. But back in the 80s, that was not a thing. It was only in the late 80s and early 90s. Now we all accept it. But it's not that the brain changes. It's that the mind is changing the brain. So what, what you two are doing is helping people develop the mind um, the mind t- the mind techniques, getting the mind under control. My podcast is called Cleaning Up the Mental Mess. So it's getting the messy mind under control and helping, therefore, to drive the direction of neuroplasticity, which is very powerful and over time. So, so really great that you understand the time frame. That's fantastic because a lot of people don't get that. That whole time frame of the 60 days minimum and so important. Multiple cycles. It's so important. And that it's mind driven, that we, and which is so hopeful. It means that we can always yeah. redirect. We can always pivot. We can, if it doesn't work, that's okay. What didn't work? Let's see what didn't work. Let's keep moving forward. And that's such an encouraging message. We're not stuck in a disease brain or a disease set of neurochemicals, which is what the biomedical model tends to shove down people's throats. We actually have this ability as humans to learn new skills like that you teach on baggage drop and share that with and apply that and share that and pay it forward to others which I love that I love the paying forward but too so that's thing I just wanted to underscore what you were saying okay let's do a do a lightning round of a wisdom pearl of wisdom so just what would you what would be the most important thing that you would say to someone today about mental health Yeah, sure. So I think sometimes I really like to hit the points that aren't emphasized as much. And I love to share the power of celebration. So if you, if everyone listening forgets everything I said today, please remember this point to celebrate yourself. And however that looks for you, um, I always say that sometimes we are better apt to process our emotions through the body. And so what does it look like for you to dance to your favorite song? Um, Sometimes that's all we need to heal. 
and process in a, just a different kind of way physiologically. And so um, put your favorite song on, dance, have a good time. Nobody's watching you. Maybe there's some people watching you, but that's okay. They're probably loving it. Um, and just enjoy your life. Find ways to celebrate yourself. Uh, we don't do it often enough, and I think it's the most important. So thank you for asking. I love that. I love that. Beautiful. Jessica. Sure. So a tip that I have that I think can be really powerful is to think about the things that we have in our lives, whether it's boundaries or routines or those types of things, and consider the difference between two different types of containers. So some containers are more like mason jars where they're rigid and they should be rigid because they're there to protect us. Maybe that means certain boundaries are firm. Whereas other things, routines, boundaries, whatever it might be, might be more like a plastic bag which is also a container. It's going to hold the liquid, but it's going to be a little bit more fluid and dynamic. And maybe that's where we want to give ourselves a little bit of space. Now there's time, there's a time and a place for both. We want to have both the mason jars and the plastic bags in our lives, but we just want to be mindful about what we need in any given circumstance. And we can mix and match and we can go from one to another and we can change them again, according to the season of our lives, but that both have value and we can utilize both of them. Beautiful. I love that. Well, thank you both so much. I've really enjoyed this conversation and I hope we'll connect again one of these days and maybe in person. Who knows? It's always nice to do these things in person. It's always so much more dynamic. And congratulations on Baggage Drop. I think it's great and it's going to be so helpful. Where can people get hold of you? So you guys can find me. This is Dr. Nina Polliné at drninapolliné.com. So you guys can find me there and I'd love to work with you. You can find me on my website, which is Dr. Jessica B. Stern, S-T-E-R-N, and is in nancy.com, drjessicabstern.com, or you can find me on Instagram, and my handle is Dr. Jessica B. Stern. Fantastic. And Baggage Drop is, a, is the name of the podcast, and that's where people can get the 10-minute Baggage Drop Pills of Wisdom. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's been wonderful. Of thank course. You thank you for us. having us.